you all. Um, uh, I know I've been doing this a few times over the last three days, but I can't get across how important this whole subject matter is to how I think we should do our work and how we can have an impact and legacy. And it just dovetails really nicely with a lot of things going on in, in, in my brain. Um, so when I submitted my papers, everyone said yes, which was a bit of a nightmare, but I only live locally, so I just thought, what the hell? Here we go. So, what I want to have a look at today is this idea I've got in my mind, how we describe what we do, which is fundamentally from find to mind. How do we take this stuff we find and transfer it into people's minds? And what I mean there is into cultural capital. So actually, what I want to get across is we are not an, uh, an industry about preservation or protection. We're actually one about creating cultural experiences and cultural value. Okay, and I want to explore this through a number of ways of, of, of how I think and how I actually present this. Um, my challenge is trying to get this down into 15 minutes. So what you're actually going to see is a series of snapshots. Now each of these leads to a much bigger question and much bigger debate. But they're only just a way into the conversation for you and you might want to explore these as you go along later. But these are techniques that I use to try and explain to people this complete and utter nightmare world we live in where nothing is right. Okay, how do you operate where actually everyone can have an idea, everyone can have a value, and what does that actually mean? So here are some of my little techniques that I use to actually explain this process, and also the things that I've learned. So my first one is talking about my grandfather's axe. So this is my grandfather's axe. Um, my father replaced the handle, and I replaced the blade. And the question is, is it still my grandfather's axe? So again, I want you to think about what objects, when we take them out, what do we actually do with them? How do we ascribe value to them? And we'll come back to this story a little later, but this is about the ascribing of value. Now, I'm the Inspector of Ancient Monuments for Historic England, and I'm sorry, the most disappointing thing I learned when I joined Historic England is we lie to you. Bloody, we do lie to you, okay? So up here you have Revo Abbey. It's a beautiful monastic site, isn't it? Well, yes, it would be, because that's what we created in the 1920s as the Ministry of Works. <laughs> Berkhamstead Castle. What type of castle is it? Well, absolutely. Why? Because in the 1920s, we made damn sure it looked like that. Okay? <laughs> that is a digger in the moat, just gently re-emphasising the moat for you. Because, hey, hey, you couldn't tell beforehand. Now, how many of you knew that? Go. Uh, Mr. Pollard is back. I told him before, so he should. Know. <laughs> okay. So what's really interesting is what's going on. Okay, we're told these are authentic sites. Well, there's a little bit of imagination going on there. I would, have, I would suggest. Here's another one. This is Sandal Castle uh, in the town of Wakefield. It's where the Battle of Wakefield happened. Although the Battle of Wakefield didn't happen in Wakefield, it actually happened in Sandal. Okay, so here you have it, brilliant, 1772 drawing, absolutely fantastic. Here is that image taken in the, 19, in the 1890s. What do you notice? Oh, the town's disappeared and the moths arrived. No problem about that, we don't mind about that one. And when, what do you look at this? This is today. What do you notice? The moth's gone, yeah, well, the moth, we are in a slight different direction. Even more interesting, no difference. They block that hole in. Oh, it's gone. It's gone. And I can tell you, absolutely honestly, I have been going to the site for 15 years and I didn't know that there used to be a window there. <laughs> the conservation of the works when they were actually done in the 70s was so comprehensive. You, there's no readability down to that hole. Okay? And it's only when I saw this image that I realised what was actually going on. So again, these, these sites are really interesting when you get into them. Of course, Sandal's got a fantastic history because in the 70s, it was excavated whole scale. Massive excavations, they were really, really brilliant. Uh, when you see the photographs of them and how people are engaged, classic, classic volunteer letter excavation and search for excavation. But to me, the really poignant thing is they actually destroyed something at Sandal in doing that process. So this is Sandal from the 1890s, um, when the moat still had water in it, and it was a very picturesque and romantic place. Now, this is deeply significant to me, because I have this photograph on my wall at home. Uh, that is the photograph taken today. So what you can see is the classic Ministry of Works approach has been taken to it. The castle has been sterilised of all its interesting stuff. It's true. And why does that impact me? 
Well, I have this photo on my wall at home because it's where my grandparents dated. They walked around this castle when it was very romantic folly. Okay? So there's a real story there, and it's entirely gone. You wouldn't know when you went there, because actually all we tell is the archaeological story. So again, what I find is really interesting, when you get into places, places change, they evolve, and people live in them differently. Now, I'm really fortunate to work with a colleague called Keith Emmerich, who is brilliant, and he actually employed me into this experiment, and we have gone on this journey, if you like, about places together. And this is his story. This is one he's found. And what I want to point out here is how sometimes simple things, absolutely the simplest things in the world, like a piece of graffiti, can take you places and tell you inspiring stories you'd never, ever think about. So this piece of graffiti is at um, uh, Old Waldorf Castle, and it basically says, A.J.M. S. Velvid, uh, the 10th of the 1st, 1943, Texas, USA. Okay? That's it. It's a piece of graffiti you'd normally imagine. Obviously, some interesting dates, 1943, we've got Texas, we've got someone's initials, and we've got someone's name. Now, um, Keith and I both have placement students from the University of York, and one of them happened to just go back home to Texas and get a very interesting position in the Texas archives. She emailed this photograph, and then they started doing some delving. And lo and behold, what a story we actually get out. So, S. Velvin is this gentleman here, Sybil, okay, and he's posted in the uh, one of the engineering divisions of the US Army to England, and he basically fights during the Second World War. Now, here is a JM, Adelaide G9. So obviously, you think Sybil and Adelaide are a couple. Not in 1943 they weren't, no. <laughs> Sybil was actually dating this guy, Fred Buckner, and Sybil was dating this lady, Patsy Ray Proctor. Except Fred is killed, he's a casualty of the Second World War, their relationship obviously ends, and after the war, these two get married, and they are married. Okay. And what we actually now find out now is this has sparked a whole series of investigations with the family and everything, and they've recreated Sybil's uh, experience during the Second World War, passing through Europe. Uh, he has unfortunately now passed away, but there is a whole interactive tour you can do going through the point. All from that one piece of graffiti. Okay. So again, this idea, we don't need to go away and inspire ourselves right in front of our eyes. We just need to look and ask the questions. But the best thing about Old Waldorf Castle is Kevin Costner. <laughs> <laughs> so for Americans, they come here for this. Okay, They come and recreate this image and have their photographs taken here. And how many of them actually know that Sybil Belden was there in 1943 actually putting that piece of graffiti on it? Now, I showed this earlier in the week, but... The thing I want to get across is inspiration can come from anyone. Anyone can be inspired by the past and they can do amazing things. And this is a group I've come in contact in the world. This is a modern, uh, this is, sorry, this is a deserted medieval village. It's called Hanging Grimston and there's been an excavation project on it for four years. But the local group have gone off on a tangent because they felt their feelings uh, about the archaeology they were doing weren't being expressed in any of the archaeological reports. So they decided to go away and do uh, an art project. And this is some of the stuff they produced. And this has to be the thing that's had the most impact on me in the last two years. One of them produced this. And all this is, is an aerial photograph printed onto a piece of cloth. And then with quilting techniques, it's been made three-dimensional. So you can actually touch it, you can actually hold it, you actually can turn it around. And you can see how she's done it. So just a whiz back. It's incredible. Just, 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 just from that, what you can do. So the simplicity of the actual inspiration can be amazing. They went and did this other thing. One of them produced this book, but it's no ordinary book. So it's all their own artwork. And basically, when you open this up, you get a finds page. So they're explaining what they've done during the excavation. It's like their, it's like their, their, their diary. Each page has an image, and each page has another story they want to tell. And you just go through until you get all four leaves are opened up. And right in the middle, you have their sort of their finds page. So it's like their personal museum. And in the red little booklet, you've got a, a label for each of those uh, little cases they've got there. And it's, it's just stunning when you look at it. And they just did it. No one told them how to do it. Nobody told them what to do. They just went and produced this by themselves. Yeah? It's so, uh, I just find it so powerful. They then had this well on site, and they were really captivated with this idea that the well told stories uh, and, you know, the myth stories that are associated with wells. And, and one of their three <coughs> just made this embroidery of it. But instead of just having it as an embroidery, they stuck it on top of a box. And when you open the box, you find all these artifacts. And I was like, why have you done that? And they said, 
Well, each of these artifacts tells me a different story. They, they're a way of capturing a different myth, a, a different idea when you actually associate it with a space. This is my story box. This is my story at the time of the well. I take it away, and that's how I engage people through it. This is, this is amazing stuff. Yeah? And how do we engage with this? None of us asked this. Um, one of the people who runs this excavation is a really good friend of mine, really good colleague, and I asked him, what do you think of this? And he just, he, in a sense, the idea that it was archaeology was really challenging. I said, this is the stuff that should be in the archaeological report. This is impact. This is legacy. This, this is stuff that, in a sense, going to that move, move on. And where does that all get me? Well, the thing that really inspires me is actually Lego. I love a bit of Lego. And this idea, because it's a really creative thing, and you can do amazing responses to it. And I've got a whole presentation about the importance of the Lego movie and heritage. Um, because it's got a really good um, theme running through it. But part of this also comes from this architect in Germany called Jans Vollmann, who uses Lego to repair bomb damaged buildings. Okay, changing perception. People stopping the streets and actually helping build this stuff. Okay. Um, but where I go with Lego, Lego is about whether you follow the rules, yeah, or whether you're actually a free thinker and you actually you're a master builder, you just just make and create whatever is around you. And actually, it's a story between a son and his dad. The Lego belongs to the dad. The dad doesn't like it being done anything apart from by the rules, so he glues it all together. Okay, <laughs> where the son wants to be a free thinker, a free builder. And it's about aspiration. So again, this is a really good analogy for heritage and aspiration. What do we do in that like creative thing? And the best website I found for that is Lego Lost at Sea. Okay, so 20 years ago, five million pieces of Lego fell off the ship and it's floating around the ocean, and these guys didn't collect it. Right? They, they gave a tweet about a few months ago with three plastic submarines on it, okay? And it was the typology of cornflake packet plastic toys. Yeah, and they actually said, ah, this one's really interesting because it's this date in the 1960s. And I was just thinking, this is incredible. But just simple stuff like that, you can then tell these most amazing stories, and you can just get into it and do it. But fascinating, when you talk about this, it's, this, isn't, this isn't old stuff, okay? Um, I showed you earlier the paradox, uh, I showed you earlier the idea of my grandfather's axe, and is in my grandfather's axe. Well, you know, that's just a rip-off of the paradox of Theseus' ship. So Theseus sailed off, slew the Minotaur, went from Athens to Crete, came back again, the Athenians were so happy, they kept his ship. And they carried on replacing his ship and repairing his ship and repairing his ship, until, after 500 years, they realised they replaced over half of it, and they asked themselves the question, well, is it still Theseus' ship? Age of victory? Uh, one would ask the same question about that, because it's probably one. I'm going to be corrected by someone in the audience, I think. I mean, maybe about 10% of the ship laid down in 1765. Why? Because it's been through several battles. It rots. It's made of wood. Yeah, it's, you know, it's been bombed. It's burned several times. So it's a really good analogy. And you're really confused. I also do this to younger generations by pointing out here up the top here, we have the bomb and the sugar babies. <laughs> <laughs> here are the three original members one, two, three. They all leave, they're all replaced by these new ladies, uh, absolutely fantastic. Uh, but then these three decide to reform because they can't call themselves the sugar babes. Who are the original sugar babes? Older members of the audience, no different fleet of Mac. Okay? <laughs> they all go, they come back again. Now, what we're getting about this, they're still fleet with Mac. So this is stuff that's all in the mind. How do you, as individuals, want to actually relate to and tell these stories? Now, there's some really interesting stuff you can go to where you can really start playing around with this. I strongly advise you to listen to the Leaf, leaf Lectures from two years ago by Hilary Mantel, where she brilliantly expresses the ideas of uh, what she does in creating um, uh, stories from, from real history and about filling in the gaps and, and, and the, the challenges about what's happening when you actually do that. They're absolutely brilliant, okay? And so there's, I found this a really interesting thing about how sometimes we belittle this literature as not being proper history, okay? Um, it's something lesser, it's something different, okay? Right, another book we must read, Lauren Bivens, 888H. Okay, this is a fantastic book where Lauren wanted, it's his first novel, and he wants to write the definitive story of how the resistance movement um, killed Reinhard Heydrich in Prague in the Second World War. He wants to write the absolute definitive story. He wants to get in their minds and write it. And he starts writing this book, and that's what he's going on with. But as he goes along, what he finds is he, he, he can't actually fill the gaps of their thinking. 
because mm. there's nothing written about it. There's, 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 there's whole gaps he can't, he can't actually write. And what he finds is he has to make it up. And that becomes a real challenge for him, because he doesn't want, he wants to write proper history. But actually what he ends up writing is this most amazing account of the challenge of writing a definitive history. And he ends up not worrying about it. And he takes on this extraordinary journey to actually do it. And it's called HHH because that actually stands for um, Himmler's brain is called hype. So basically this is the guy who invented the final solution. Okay, so but it's a really brilliant way of actually helping us just lighten up, okay? We don't actually have to be right. I'd argue we can, we can never be right. Um, last two. There's an interesting way where history plays this in reverse. Okay, so this is the Battle of Dawkins by um, George Chesney, written in the 1870s in Blackwood's Mag Gentleman's Magazine. This is about a guy who fought in the Battle of Dawking in 1940 uh, against the Prussian, uh, sorry, in, 19, in 1870 against the Prussians and lost. They lost the Battle of Dawking and so basically England and Britain stopped existing. Okay. Um, it was so influential, this is what led to the Palmerston Courts being built. The changed British foreign, foreign policy. So this is fiction changing what we will now call history. This one, Erskine Childers, Riddle in the Sands, did exactly the same thing in 1905 when he wrote it. This led to uh, uh, um, Scarborough Flow being developed, the first forts being defended, the forts in the Humber being built. It actually changed British foreign policy to actually uh, be worried about the German Navy in the North Sea. Okay, so why are we so worried about fiction? Fiction actually can influence history and everything. And this is where it gets to me about this whole dynamic nature of what it actually means. So HMS Victory. You know, actually, HMS Victory only survives because every generation has a crisis about it surviving. Mm. Yeah? And the best thing about HMS Victory, when I was seven, I went there and I bought a bit of HMS Victory. I was so excited. Yeah? My, my bit of HMS I bought a bit. You, know, you sold it to me. <laughs> you know, don't tell me off. You sold it to me. All right? Okay? Ah, oh, so excited. I now realise it was probably a replacement, a replacement, a replacement, a replacement, a replacement. So it might have only been five years old. Who knows? And the worst thing is, I've actually lost it. So it doesn't really matter. <laughs> <laughs> it's still These guys were doing what they were doing. Were doing what they were doing because that was their place in time, and we shouldn't be critical of them. You know, I've got my job because I can actually do it. Um, these, Les, this is David and Leslie Sharp. They're the guys from Henry Riverston. They're amazing when they talk about their feelings from doing archaeology and their way of expressing. Was, was, was absolutely fantastic. And I've been involved in this, in Hatfield Colliery, the last headstocks in the Doncaster coal field. And when I got there, the, you know, it's listed for its technological importance. The community told us so much about how, what it meant to them. It's actually, it's more significant for its communal value than anything. Then they wrote poetry about it and not, and they described it as a gypsy pit, okay? Because it was, because it survived so long after the second world, uh, after the closure of the, the the coal mines in the north of England, it employed people from all over the north of England. So they moved to it. So unlike coming from your village and going to it, you came from all over the north of England. That had a really different resonance to them, and we were able to catch them. But what I'm now talking about is all these different people. And my real point here, and what my work really is about, is this concept. Heritage and heritage values are like sound waves. Okay? A sound wave, we set it off in motion, and we hope it just carries on, but all sound waves ultimately die out. They die out and then we go in and turn up the volume. Okay? So I like my job to actually control it, hopefully trying to control the volume in places, helping people turn their volume up. But the real challenge I have is everyone has a different sound wave. Okay? So if you imagine everyone's got a different sound wave, they're all competing with each other, we live in a world of enormous white noise. Okay? So how might we envisage our world as the place where we try and help, mm, help work with that white noise to turn it, not in, not, turn it from not being white noise, but maybe turn it into a symphony, or even, because we don't want to control everything, turn it into a jazz ensemble where everyone just has a go and creates the most amazing sound. That's what inspiration is about.